Hello and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by the man himself for the episode 258. Yes, the man himself, Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. Good morning, listeners, subscribers, and viewers. Man, I got to admit, Mike, it's really fun to be digging into today's episode number 258 with our second episode within the Austin Cleon series. What a big series. He, he kind of opened us up in that first one to giving us the permission and demystifying the idea of creative effort and creative works. And now, today, Mark, we are going to go beyond doing some work. We're going to show your work, right? Oh, you're right, Mike. If last week we were digging into the idea of steel like an artist, uh, inspiration, um, the concept of creativity and getting vibes as well as permission from individuals, uh, you know, we touched upon Elizabeth Gilbert, for example, finding that permission is now uh, the foundation that we can build on when it comes to the second book that we're going to dig into, Show Your Work, which I think is we're going to reveal and explore and be inspired by today, is a little bit more around the idea of sharing, the idea of finding more inspiration, but also being able to put your work out there, which I think is probably the second hardest thing, or maybe the hardest to individuals who want to go out and create. Not only is it starting just on day one but actually it's getting that work out there isn't it sometimes that's the locker for a lot of people you are so spot on there i think if we're if we're a bit frank and honest with ourselves we're often we're often thinking about what others are going to say before we've even shown it which is crazy in itself right um and uh you know we need to step in the arena and take our inspiration from brene brown and i think as far as the ideas in show your work, I think what Austin is going to help us do is get going, get the work moving, start sharing, start collaborating, and realizing that the path and the journey of creativity is insanely collaborative and it's very mm. iterative. Like I was uh, just saying to you before we started recording, when I think about the first episodes of this show, of my like, oh my gosh, is that awful? But hey, I had to start somewhere, and we were both laughing at ourselves in our early days. Two hundred and fifty yeah. plus episodes later, okay, hey, we can at least we can record it properly. Who knows mm. about the rest? But the point yeah. is, if you're ready to show your work and to get through the fear and the uncertainty, this is the show for you, our members, listeners, and viewers. Mark, where do we begin? What a great intro, Mike. Thank you for that. Let's dive straight in with Austin Cleon himself. Now, we're going to hear from Austin chatting to the legend Brian Johnson to really set the scene around this book, because you're right, there are a number of different themes within it. Let's hear from Austin specifically calling out what he uh, really calls out as the misunderstanding of the book, but also why we all need to just start early. You know, when I was on tour for Steel Like an Artist, that was the big question I got asked, just like every other author. You know, it's like, how'd you do this? How'd you get published? How'd you grow an audience? Like, how do you do your blog? You know, and that's all kind of, you know, questions about self-promotion. And I I just thought, you know, I'm just going to roll with this and I'm going to write a book about self-promotion for people who hate the very idea of self-promotion. And what Show Your Work is about is there's a particular way of working that I noticed in the people that I admire. And what they do is that they're they're connected. They're online and they're sharing little bits and pieces of their work over time as they're working. They still have this kind of – they have figured out a way to get their work done but to not totally disappear for eons before they come back and kind of share. They're kind of just doing these little daily bits and pieces. And most of it is their process. It's like, um, you know, like for a writer, it might be like what they're reading or what they're thinking about or, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Might not even be their actual work, but they're sharing these little bits and pieces of their creative life and their process over time and what that turns into as an audience that's then kind of primed for their work when they actually want to release something. And so what I wanted to do is write a kind of operating manual 
for this way of working. And uh, that's why I call it show your work. And that the big idea of show your work is to not wait until you have this perfect, finished, polished product that you want everyone to know about, but to start kind of sharing little bits and pieces of your creative life before something is ready. And the big misunderstanding of the book is that you like show a bunch of rough drafts and like, uh, you know, Oh, I got to show my work before it's ready. And like that kind of thing, that's not necessarily what the book is about. That's fine if you want to do that. But really the book is about rethinking your whole process in terms of what's useful or interesting about it that you could share with people. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I really poke writers about is like, look, if you're a great writer, you're working on writing and you don't, you know, you can't necessarily show your rough drafts because they're not ready yet. They need to be shown to like a, you know, like a writer's group or your editor or something, but you are a great reader because every writer is a great reader. So I'm like, you should be sharing the things you're reading, the things you're inspired by, you know, that kind of thing. You know, rethinking the process is fundamentally starting with this point that uh, Austin made Mark, and that is like you do not have to wait for the mm. final polished, finished, amazing, completed works of Mark Pearson Freeland. You can say, hey, I saw this movie. I read this article. Mm. I really I took this interesting photo. I want to share it. Um, and, you know, the secret about this is it's classically breaking things down into small bits. Yeah. And sharing something small versus the finished life works of Mark, it's like two totally different things. So if you really enjoyed an article that is connected to the theme that you're writing a book on, as the person who is writing a book, which is not published yet, you have every right in the world to go out and say, hey, guys, I read this and I thought this was really powerful. What do you mm -hmm. think? And maybe those comments and conversations bring you even further inspiration to producing your book. This to mm -hmm. me, taking you know, this moment to say, I am not going to sit in an ivory tower for years because the risk is we all know we probably won't publish it that way, right? Yes. Yeah, big time. <laughs> right? Yeah. And rather yeah. think about an iterative continue sharing smaller bits, whether directly or indirectly related to your work, to your final mm. works. I think this is huge because you don't experience as much fear and self-doubt sharing a little thing than when you do a big thing. And if you can yeah. embrace that, I think then you sort of get in the habit of writing, creating, designing, sharing. And then this is how you can inspire your main process by just sharing these little snacks along the way. Mm, yeah, delicious. Yes. Little uh, amuse, amuse bouche, I suppose. Ooh, yes. But the, the, I think you're totally right, Mike. And the, the thing that stands out to me, obviously, we know that Austin's quite a fan of, of sharing work. You know, he, he's a bit of a creative uh, powerhouse. We heard a lot from, um, him in the previous episode with regards to newspaper blackouts, you know, just coming up with cool, quirky, little ideas that maybe then become bigger, a little bit like a snowball rolling down a hill over time. So the benefit I think that Austin's probably seen with a lot of his content is he'll put it out there, maybe he'll get some feedback, maybe some positive reinforcement that then enables him to gather speed. And I think what I really take out from the work of Austin, and obviously specifically today with Show Your Work, is to not fear the idea of sharing your work. You know, we know that a lot of people will be put off uh, from not doing that. They'll mm. probably be sitting on maybe a draft or maybe even a finished product of whatever it might be for a long time because they're afraid of that criticism. And I think what we are hearing from people like Brené, Elizabeth Gilbert, but also obviously Austin here, is to not let those big battles that we have in our head when it comes to the fear of feedback, whether people are going to accept your product or your book or whatever it might be, or whether they're going to give you negative input. To fear all of that is a great excuse. It's a great reason to oh, yeah. flee from the yes. idea of putting something out in the world that maybe you're really passionate about. Yes. And I think that battle is always often in our heads. And instead, what we need to do 
through the encouragement of, of Austin, for example, by starting early, maybe it gives you that little bit of confidence to continue not only getting that inspiration, but actually by the time the finished product comes out, you're kind of comfortable. Yeah. You know? It's a little it's bit a rhythm. like putting the mindset into practice, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I For some strange reason, as you were talking then, I thought about Napoleon and mm. When Ryan Holiday writes about Napoleon and good versus bad news, Napoleon would prioritize bad news and delay the good news because mm. he found it more beneficial to hear feedback, negative feedback, negative news than to hear all just the light, fluffy stuff. And the reason mm. I went there is something we've seen in the show is if you look at these extreme examples of high performers, they invariably do not fear problems, negative feedback, and the best ones search out the cynics. They search mm. out the negative feedback because they see an ultimate truth. If you can face your greatest fear, the greatest criticisms, actually that is the path to the greatest achievements. Mm. So yeah. whilst I know this is a little abstract, I think the point here is by starting small, we can start a journey of putting our work out there and taking whatever comes, good or bad, from that and seeing it all as part of a chance to learn, understand, and grow. And I think if there was one bad habit we all tend to have as human beings is, you know, we're working on a thing and it's pretty good. It's not quite great. And you're like, oh, I don't want to share it yet. I don't want to tell people about it yet. I think the real problem is that yet becomes forever. Yes. Yes. I agree. I, I, and I think you're, you're totally right with the idea of sharing despite the fear of negative feedback. You yeah. know, we, we, we saw a lot of that with the early doors of, of uh, SpaceX, yeah. you know, with Elon. You know, he got a lot of criticism from yep. astronauts, from the uh, private space, or sorry, the public space, with regards to space exploration and yep. so on. And what's interesting now, I think maybe through the process that he had of gathering feedback, inputs, guidance, and so on, is that actually now the world is pretty captivated by it. You know, you can watch SpaceX uh, uh, takeoffs and launches quite easily nowadays because everybody's sort of curious yes and i wonder whether that is a product of taking everybody on the journey so enabling and showing your processes showing your work you take a lot of the the haters let's call it along that journey with you and by the end of it you can't do anything but respect the individual or the business that's kind of gone through that process can you so check this out i want to remind you of this little anecdote we had in one of our elon shows where the interviewer says to him, geez, it must have been hard having your childhood heroes mm. criticizing you publicly. And mm. there was this really long pause and this very fragile answer of yes. So it's not yeah. like it didn't hurt, but mm. the difference about Elon is he kept going regardless. How many of us could be publicly criticized by our mm. childhood heroes in front of everyone yeah. and keep going because that's the bar. Yeah. That's the bar that we have to. And so if you just say, yep, I'm going to put myself out there, I'm going to put my work out there, I'm going to see what comes, we get crazy comments for the show. <laughs> yeah. but that's just yeah. part of how it is. That's we it. also get great ones, and those great ones often mm. come from our members, Mark. That's right. So without further ado, obviously, we know and love and appreciate all of our members who are with us day in, day out, providing feedback, providing recommendations, as well as uh, uh, inspirational moments for you and I, Mike, as well as the whole Moonshots family. We appreciate every single one of them. So please welcome in all of our Moonshots members, Bob, Ken, Dietmar, Marjan, Connor, Lisa, Sid and Mr. Bonjour. Paul, Burr, Kalman, Joe, Christian, Samuela, Barbara and Deborah, Lasse, Steve, Craig and Ravi, Eva, Raul, Nicoada and Ingram, Dirk, Venkata, Marco, Jet, Roger, Steph, Rora, Nimelin, <gasps> Diana, Christoph, Denise, Smitty, Corey, uh, Daniela, Mike and Antonio, Zachary, Austin, Fred, Jez, Ola, Andy, Diana, Margie, Chris, 
Ron and Jasper, who have brought, joined us very, very recently. Thank you so much, John, uh, Jasper and Ron, for joining us. I know I didn't call out our annual members within that group, so I'm going to have to let all of our members remember and notice when they joined but I'll reveal all of those next week. <laughs> there you go. That is the cliffhanger, huh? Um, yes. <laughs> now, Mark, we're we're obviously very grateful um, to all of our members, and that really helps us produce our Moonshots Master Series, which is exclusively available for members. We just did the most recent one last week on a growth mindset. So if you are interested in uh, listening to that, head over to moonshots.io and click on that big members button and uh, the Moonshots Master Series will be awaiting you. What's also Mm. awaiting you and especially me, Mark, is that when it comes to creativity, you don't need to be a genius. This is a bit of a relief for me because I think I can categorically say I am not a genius. But (laughs) Austin has some thoughts on this, so why don't you let it rip? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. And and. I think where we're going to go with this next clip from Mike Nardi is exactly that. We're going to find a little bit of permission as well as reassurance when it comes to sharing and being open with what inspires us and our creativity. Kind of lays things out in a way where, you know, throughout history, people kind of have this idea of geniuses where they're they're kind of working on all their genius stuff in private for years and years and years, and then poof, they release it to the world, everyone's amazed, and they get all this recognition. But the reality is that this is kind of rarely the case, and these geniuses that are so good at the things they're good at usually get good at it by interacting in social circles with other people, like-minded people, or people who share similar interests. And that's really a fine thing to do. There's no harm in being an amateur as you work on your skills in anything and build your way up, just like there's no harm in being an amateur or novice freelancer. Doing things like sharing your experiences with other freelancers, chatting, helping each other, and trying to grow together, trying to build our skill sets together as freelancers. This is huge, right? Because I think everybody would mostly agree if we put 100 people in a room and said, is Einstein a genius? Of course, E equals MC squared. Okay. But, you know, the truth that we revealed on our study of Einstein is a couple of things. First of all, very slow as a kid to develop. Um, Two, he categorically said, I do not think I am smarter than the average person. Mm. And then he revealed to us, Mark, what he did do. Do you remember? Mm. He just tried again and again. He never gave up, did he? Yes. And he, uh, to build on that, he said he just focused on the one problem for an extremely mm. long time. And what we yeah. know is a lot of people, as to your point, don't have the daily habits. And if they do, they don't last for long enough right? Think about the whole diet industry is predicated on people that can't adhere to a balanced diet. So they have to go swings and roundabouts, right? Mm. My my interesting thing here is he was also uh, very active in academia, talking to a lot of other scientists, sharing Mm. ideas. Sometimes he would work on something for seven years and sharing Mm. and discussing with others. Fast forward to today, we mentioned Elon and SpaceX. They're effectively sharing their journey along the way as well. You'll remember yeah. there was the whole build up to being able to get a rocket to land and be reused a second time. And now they're on to more and more. They're pushing for more distance, et cetera, et cetera. My point is they're sharing and you can make your work a sharing moment too. And I, I, I cannot stress that if you share your work, You are bound to make it better. And I I just think, Mark, how many times have you been in a situation where you and I have chatted, I've shared an idea with you, you give me a build or vice versa, or in other areas of your life, you're like, I'm thinking about this. And with the right message to the right person, you can get amazing feedback. And that Mm. will take you, push you further because we all know that we can be going in the tunnel and we're just focused on the thing. And there are just moments where you run out of all your gas, despite your Mm. effort. It is like, what it's really saying to you is 
Go out, share that work, get new inspiration, and that will rejuvenate you and you can go again, right? Mm, yeah, big time. I mean, you're, you're right. There's a, there's a couple of things that stand out to me, both within the Mike Gnarly clip as well as where you were just taking us there. The first of which, similar to your reference with Einstein, we know from, um, I suppose you could say pop culture, but also from the broader sense of the science world, that the majority of key uh, revelations within the, an academic space is through collaboration, but also uh, feedback from your peers. That's why you have medical journals. That's why you have peer reviews. Yes. At the end of the day, just because you and I say, hey, everybody, this is the best book in the world. Yeah. Somebody else probably will want to go out and get a second opinion. Yeah. That's the case with medicine. That's the case with uh, probably inventors and yes. so on. What's safe? What are consumers going to get? Research, consumer groups, and so on and so forth are all, in my mind, part and parcel of this concept, which is showing your work, mm -hmm. getting it better and ready for that end consumer. What also stood out to me, as I think about where Austin's journey is taking us, um, obviously this is episode two out of three in our Austin series, is how you effectively work well and proactively in a work from home situation. So where I see the real value of collaboration um, in the careers that I've had is when I've been able to work with each other. Yeah. You, know, you and I collaborating yeah. you know, on big whiteboards and so on. That then, you know, obviously became, you know, digital through a work from home situation where I think Austin is inviting our um, curiosity as well as uh, forgiveness or openness is to put your work out there in a work from home situation where maybe you don't have somebody to bounce around ideas. Right. You know, you're in your your um, uh, uh, con Contained area, let's say, of your brain. Yeah, you've got an idea. You don't know how to share it. Maybe you don't know how to communicate it to your partner, your friends, maybe your colleagues. Instead, just putting out little pieces that are inspiring you is essentially uh, a, a, a putting a, a marker in the road of what is taking you to your final destination. Totally. And along that journey, if people say, "Hey, that book is great. You should also look into X, Y, or Z." that might take you even further down the rabbit hole of, let's say, it's design thinking or agile mindset or whatever it is, maybe it's a piece of music, that will only enable you to go further down that road and make it much, much better. So I think it's really about this idea of collaboration, isn't it? It totally is. And we see this in the form of sports team, uh, groups of mm. founders and startups, um, there are all these collaborations happening all over the world. And even with people like academics, like Einstein, mm -hmm. you actually, when you look into it, it was a very collaborative approach. Yeah. And I think that many of us think that maybe the work won't be appreciated. Maybe it'll get negative feedback. Many of us think maybe people will steal my ideas. But here's mm -hmm. the thing. What we've also learned is, let's say you've got an idea for a book, right? That may well and truly be the case that you share it and someone says, oh, I want to write that book. Mm. But if they haven't been obsessed with it in the way you have, and if they haven't done the work that you have, and also remember this, it will be your point of view will be unique. Because as Elizabeth Gilbert teaches us, everyone is different to everyone's ideas, even when writing on the same topics are different. This is what you have to figure out. Don't fear people stealing your ideas because you still have to go do them, you know, the perspiration yeah. bit, right? Two, yeah. the chances are if you have any EQ radar, you'll know the right people to share it with. And genuinely, I think you'll find if you share your idea, they will reciprocate with feedback and maybe they share an idea with you and you can help them. And once you build that trust, then you can be an open smorgasbord of ideas. <laughs> and what an amazing idea that is. Yeah. You know, the ability to jump in and out. It's similar to uh, the Moonshots model, Mike. You know, there's so much content and ideas within all of the shows, all 258 shows yes. we've done in three, 33 master series, mm -hmm. which obviously is available for, for members only. There's so many moments of inspiration within each of those that I think the idea of putting it all out there, making it available, 
is the way that we find inspiration, not only as kind of consumers of that content, you know, you can drop in and out much like you can on, you know, platforms like YouTube, but also as creators, it's, it's so valuable to be able to put everything out there and see what sticks, yeah. what people are inspired by, yeah. because that can only help us and, and other creators, you know, continue to get better. You're spot on there. So hopefully what we've started to do now is we've kind of got the work sharing early in the process and these little micro um, mm. snippets, stories, snackable content, snackable ideas. And I think also reminding you that you don't have to be a genius because your work will always be unique because it's your work. And so get over the hump. Don't be scared of getting critiqued or people stealing your ideas because one of the things we've learned from Austin is every idea has already been done before. So he, he in fact, it, it encourages us to steal from others and build something that is new, remixing old things. Mm. So now this gives us the chance to jump into the creative patterns, the creative habits, and we've got a bit of a classic uh, moonshotter mm. coming up. So why don't you kind of set us up now to move into getting this creative work out there? Yeah, you're right. Now let's figure out how we might be able to put a little bit of this into practice. But I think part and parcel of, of actually putting your work out there is understanding the right way of doing it and the right way of being creative and accessing the right processes. As we heard earlier, it's all about maybe starting to share early. We're now going to take that a little bit further, Mike. We're going to hear again from Brian Johnson, Moonshots legend. We Love him on the show here. He's going to now talk to us a little bit more about how to find rhythms, not only of work, but also of rest when you're looking to create. So let's hear from Brian now. Talk to us about micro sabbaticals. Micro sabbaticals. So sabbatical is related to Sabbath. Once every seven days you rest. Well, in academics, for example, one year out of seven, they'll take off for a sabbatical, right? Now I was laughing as I was typing this because it was about seven years ago that I took a one year sabbatical, took a couple years off, but a one year sabbatical to go to Bali, right? My life is so different now with the child being married, with a kid and with all these other things we got going on, um, that it was actually funny for me to imagine that version of my life. But what we can do if we can't carve out the year for the sabbatical in the near term is we can create micro sabbaticals. Every single day and week and month, we can create ways to get away from our work. And this is in the context of if you want to really engage in your work, you have to know how to disengage. You can't always be on, right? So I'm gonna keep on drawing this in all the episodes where it makes sense. We need to make waves. We need to train recovery. People talk about, well, how do you get so much done? Well, it's because I'm focused and I'm as focused in being off. As Jim Lohr taught us, the best athletes, the tennis players that he studied, were the ones who recovered the best between points. They relaxed deeply and profoundly. We just talked about this in A Mind for Numbers. She says we have a focused mode of thinking, and then we have a diffuse mode of thinking. You need to have distributive learning, where you do some of one, then some of the other. Kind of like the base camp was the metaphor that she used, right? If you're ascending Everest and you want to put your old flag up there, you have a base camp here, you work hard and you climb, you have another base camp, you work hard, you climb, and you continue doing that. So we need to create those rhythms in our lives if we want to create in powerful ways consistently and sustainably over the long run. Someone commented recently on the 10X rule by Grant Cardone. They said, look, the only way you can do that is with caffeine. Well, that's one way to do it, but that's trying to do this and to try to keep on going up and you do that, and you're gonna go like that. And you're not gonna be able to get back up at will. You need to oscillate. The best way to do that, again, is sleep. If you're not getting an adequate amount of sleep, you're not going to give yourself the best chance you can to optimize micro sabbaticals. What's your number one self-care habit? Do you remember that? We talked about that with Michelle Seeger. You wanna actualize your potential, you need to have a strong base. She asks, what's your number one non-negotiable self-care habit? The thing that if you don't do it, you're not gonna have as great of a day as you could. Identify your number one and then do that every single day as a gift to yourself in our little micro sabbatical. That's our fourth big idea. So understanding your creative rhythms, this is huge, right? Because I think I really didn't understand um, my creative rhythms 
too well up until probably the last two or three years, Mark. Um, so mm. I think what we could do is something fun now. I think what we could do is let's share our creative rhythms and yep. let's let's try and like throw out as many suggestions that work for us that might work for our listeners. So my number one non-negotiable is sleep. So I will literally sacrifice anything else bar sleep. So if it comes to it, I will skip a run. I will move mm. meetings. If I've been up working late and I'm not going to get asleep till midnight, I at least need to give myself till eight. It's just what I need. And sometimes if I am going to bed at 12 and waking up at eight, I actually know that the sleep then won't be as good a quality. So I'll probably go for eight and a half hours of sleep. Um, this is my number one non-negotiable. Mm. What I know is that whenever I'm in like the in a busy schedule and very, very um, occupied with all my work, I know as a promise to myself that sleep is priority number one. What about you? Yeah, um, sleep is enormous. I think, I, and I love this kind of topic of exploring how we can be, you know, creative and efficient and so on. So I think there's a lot of tips that you and I probably have, Mike. For me, and I know we've said it before, exercise is absolutely essential. Every day. You've got to get the uh, cobwebs out of your brain, first mm -hmm. of all. So if you've had a nice solid amount of sleep, typically I try and go to bed pretty early. I try and wake up early because I think the most... Uh, effective use of my brain is often when I'm in the morning. That's yep. my sort of circadian rhythm. A bit of exercise to pair that, get the cobwebs out, oh, get yeah. your blood moving, yes. um, ideally in a way that not only kind of uh, challenges your body, maybe you feel a bit exhausted afterwards, yep. Yep. Um, but more importantly, it's something that gets you moving and you feel connected and present. I think is one of the key moments for me and mm -hmm. what I try and foster, whether it's going for a run or a swim or just a 30 to 60 minute walk yeah. out in nature, something that grounds you and connects you, yeah. I think is, is essential for my journey. Yep. Uh, some other ones for me, because I like all of those, journal in the mm -hmm. morning, stretch in the yep. morning, breath work, yep. meditation in the morning. These are all great. Um, I definitely need, I like uh, if I think about rhythms, there's the three, two, one rule. Okay. Yes. You stop eating three hours before bed. Mm. You stop drinking two hours before bed. You stop screens one hour before bed. I find mm. this one really, really, really powerful. Um, and here's a n nice novel one is to allocate 30 minutes a week of reading spontaneously. So I literally go to my book library along the wall and will mm. pick something that is not part of my workflow. So books play mm. a huge role of my daily work. I'm talking about grab a design book, gra grab the mm. Data is Beautiful book, uh, the photo agency Magnum. I've got this massive copy table oh. book of Magnum's Thank best you. shots. Like pick up something spontaneous, 30 minutes a week, 4 o'clock every Friday afternoon, that's when it's scheduled. Have you mm. got like a fun, creative thing that you, your, your own like artist pages or creative pages? Yeah. You, you know what I find uh, I do more of nowadays? Um, and, and you're right. It's, it's partly by establishing a routine, something that you come back to quite regularly. And yep. I like the, the book. Similar to that is photos. Yeah. I like to look back at some of the photos that I've taken, maybe over the past week or so, but I also go further back than that, specifically around photos that I've taken out and about that have has inspired me. You know, some of our eagle-eyed uh, Patreon and member subscribers would have noticed an email that went out a couple of weeks ago referencing the beautiful Tuscan Hills. But that wasn't just a coincidence or a drive from you and I, Mike, to get out and in, 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 uh, get into Europe. It's actually where I was located. So what I found... I was doing in Italy was taking photos of of pieces of maybe art, graffiti, a bit of history out in the culture, out, out in the community, and so on. That I now find myself looking back at because it inspires me. Yeah, that has now entered into my routine as something that I want to 
go back to as a as a sort of ritual because it does not only ground me it puts me in not only the present but also helps me appreciate okay well where else have i been what have i done yes and prior to them working on something you know rather than jumping straight in that's that's kind of helping me um get inspired i think yeah and i so i think the the thing here is there's a there's something going on that I think you and I both share, which is if you haven't scheduled it as a recurring event in the calendar, Mm. the chances are it's not going to become a habit. Big time. Big time. And if you want to build this creative rhythm, like um, at the beginning of the year I discovered in my vacation by picking up books sort of randomly, wandering my own library, if you will, Mm. (laughs) And then I was like, oh, wow, it's so, there's something creatively feels really great about just picking up uh, one of these books randomly. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of history of design, um, oh, just like a ton, right? The point, I've even got like the artwork sketches that Ridley Scott did for Blade Runner. And sometimes I flick oh, through that because it's just so cool mm. to think that he mm. drew it, he shot it, he directed it. It was amazing. Mm. Um, but allocating time to get into that, I find that process has to be scheduled. And it might sound a little over the top, right? But four o'clock Fridays, it's the time to do it. Because what I find is, despite enjoying it so much, if I don't use the calendar to prompt me, like before I know it, I've forgotten about it and then I've put something mm-hmm. else in there and there's a call or a meeting or something. And then I've lost touch with that creative rhythm that uh, that Austin talks about in the book. Yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. I, I'm also a huge fan of time blocking, of putting it into my diary. I utilize Todoist uh, every single day um, in order to help me prioritize. You know, I think the, the main blocker when it comes to not only working creatively, you know, churning out original ideas as well as pieces of content uh, like books and so on, but also doing any type of work that I need to do, it's the distractions that get in the way. Mm. And the build on that is obviously decluttering, you know, your desk, but also turning off social media, so on and so forth. But actually having the time set aside yeah. and actually prioritizing prior yep. to sitting down and working yep. is, I think, the secret that helps me go from, you know, let's say it's zero miles an hour to maybe 100 miles an hour is because I've prepared prior to yeah. the event. Yeah, totally. And it's almost like what where we're going here is that if you want to build a creative rhythm, you have to do the kind of highly organized schedule the time mm. to let your mind go free. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you just know it's four o'clock Fridays, that's when it's happening, then you sort of start to orientate yourself, but you also approach that moment like, ooh, ooh, mm. creative reading time mm. coming up. Yay. Yeah, and exactly. here's the interesting thing. Then when you have that time allocated, I think you've made yourself more open to the possibilities of learning from others, um, finding inspiration yeah. from around the world. And what's so good is you have expertly found just the clip from Austin talking about this very subject. Look, sadly, Mike, we're coming to the end of our show today on Show Your Work. I've been super inspired. I've got so many notes from the clips that we've delved into from Austin. But you're right. We do have one final secret clip, which is going to help us really appreciate the value of working with others, but also absorbing the work of others. So let's hear from Austin telling us to start absorbing today. So when my first book, Newspaper Blackout, came out, You know, a lot of artists think that sharing is just a matter of putting their work in front of people where they can see it, you know, but sharing really means opening up and kind of having a relationship with your audience. Um, It means letting your audience kind of talk back to you and alongside you and learning something from them, actually thinking of them as like co-learners or like co-conspirators. So when Newspaper Blackout came out, I didn't want to keep the technique to myself. Like I wanted to let other people try out the technique. So instead of doing book readings, what we do is we do poetry workshops. And I'd actually encourage people to make their own poems. And then this crazy thing would happen at these workshops. Full-grown adults would get up and read their poems. And I, I've never seen any kind of adult event where, where people, adult event, that sounds you know, kind of scandalous. Um, 
And I've never seen any adults in a room with strangers, you know, get up and read their poems. This is a really awesome thing. And then I would start getting emails from teachers who actually use the poems in their classrooms. And I'd just get these awesome photos of like all these teenagers with like blackout poetry up on the wall and kind of like looking at what they've made and sharing it with each other. So I thought, man, there should really be a place where people can share, you know, I'm not just sharing my own poems, like there should be a place where people can share the stuff that they've made. So that's when I started newspaperblackout.com. And, you know, newspaperblackout.com has taken off in a way that I just never expected. Like, we've published, I think we have like 80,000 readers or something, and, you know, it's bigger than most literary journals. And um, we've published poems, I say we, it's me, royal we. <laughs> That weird thing. Well, yeah, we, like we're some organization. Um, it's me in my underwear at home posting the poems. <laughs> but, you know, we posted people from all over the world, and we've got just, you know, hundreds and thousands of, of poems right now. And what's really interesting about this is I thought it was some, like, philanthropic measure on my part. Oh, let me give a voice to the masses, give them a place where they can share their own stuff. But... What's amazing is like, I learn just as much from these poems that people send me as I think they do from, from the ones I post. I mean, I find all kinds of awesome stuff to steal, you know, from these people who send me these really cool poems. Uh, by the way, our viewers will love this, Mark. Um, how cool was some of this artwork? That was really neat, right? Yeah, beautiful, right? Uh, it was stunning uh, pieces of work as well. Because yeah. <laughs> when you just imagined all these black and white wiping out, you know, blacking out the words, but there was these beautiful illustrations, different colors. Uh, once again, this mm. is what happens when you open yourself up, create the rhythms, share the work, mm. collaborate and iterate, then good things really happen, don't they? Yeah, look, and, and I, I find his work with the newspaper blackouts is a great visual demonstration, particularly of the, the format that he did it, putting it out there just as a bit of a tester. I think the newspaper blackout project from Austin is, a, is the culmination of show your work. You know, he put it out there. It was just a test mm -hmm. and gradually became a book. But I think the key thing for, for you and I, our members, our listeners and, and viewers is that process just started with that little bit of courage. You know, yeah. Trying something new. Let's yes. put it out there, put it online. And now he's referencing the success of it, but also more importantly, the I think the knock on effect that it's probably had for him. Yes. Which is understanding the value of collaborating with others as well as inviting feedback from yeah. the general public, which I think is wonderful. It's also great to see you know, an author or an expert eating their own dog food, right? Like, you <laughs> yeah, know what exactly. I mean? Like they actually yeah, do yeah. the thing and they share with you yeah. the results of the thing they're telling you to do. <laughs> yeah, that's it. The proof, yeah. that's how the sausage is made. Exactly. And also seeing what, what it looks like in the end, I think is a great um, demonstration and call out for, for us as we come to the end of Show Your Work, which is if you do put it out there, the stuff you might get back is going to be so valuable for, for next time. Yeah. Yeah. as well as this current project. Well, there you go, Mark. I mean, we've covered a lot about sharing your work with the world. We've dove deep into, into this body of work from Austin Cleon. And by the way, we still have one more book to go, which is fantastic. But for this book, yeah. Mark, of those four ideas, which one is your personal homework assignment? Well, I think it would be um, uh, a pretty, pretty, expected to yeah. call out and say starting today yeah. is the way to do it just yeah. get going but yeah. i actually like the idea that brian calls out from austin's book around the micro sabbaticals mm. build into your routine not only the courage to put your work out there but also the processes within your creative journey to create something that you want to put out there yeah. something that you want to experience and and get feedback on yeah. what about you mike what's standing out for you <sighs> You know, so because we're sharing so much work ourselves on this show mm. and I do in addition to this show, like start sharing early. I, I feel I got that one uh, under control. Mm. I, I could do more to absorb from others. Like I, I would say mm. I probably fall in the basket of being so busy with the uh, enormous Mike Parsons publishing empire 
that I probably don't take enough time uh, to absorb from others. So that's going to be my yeah. little homework. That's a good call out. Yeah. I think you're totally right there. Yeah. yeah. And there's so many great ways to do that today. Oh, so. geez. Too much. Too much good stuff. Too much good stuff. <laughs> well, Mark, I want to say thank you to you uh, joining me here on show 258. And you know who else is joining us? A big thank you to them, our members, viewers, and listeners too, because we were figuring it out, how to show your work, uh, the book by Austin Cleon, the second part of our series. And we had four big ideas. Start sharing early. You don't have to be a genius. You just have to be you. And as you do that, build a rhythm, work hard, and find the ups and the sabbaticals so you can recharge the batteries so that great things can come to you. You can start absorbing today so you can be better tomorrow. And boy, is that something we're all about here on the Moonshots podcast. That's a wrap.